Welcome to Western Wisconsin Journal. I'm Bobby Pominville and I'm your art reporter. And I try really hard to do all facets of the arts. And today I'm delighted to have a band person here, Dr. Jack Stamp. Welcome to the show. Pleasure to be back with you, Bobby. Oh, it's been a few years, I know that. It's been several years, yes. And it's gonna be really interesting to talk about what you've been doing but first, I want to go through a little bit of your resume, which is very impressive. You have a BS in music education from Indiana University of Pennsylvania, where you were director of band studies at Correct. Indiana University of Pennsylvania. And you have a doctor of musical arts in conducting at Michigan State University. Correct. Very impressive. International composer. Oh, that's your kind of your newer job. You're an international composer in association to the Grimethorpe Collier. Say it again. Collery. Collery. Brass band. I had to actually look up what that was, but I know you'll tell us. And you are a former adjunct professor at UW, UW in River Falls. So I would like to start out with some band information. Um, yeah. Your resume is very impressive as a band director. Um, could you share some highlights of your experiences at Indiana University in Pennsylvania? Right, well, it's interesting to be invited back to teach at the institution that you, where you got your bachelor's degree. And I had taught for 11 years prior to going back to Indiana. I went to Indiana PA in, 1990, <clears throat> pardon me, and stopped, taught there for 25 years. I think what, what I was able to do is bring kind of a national presence or exposure to the university music department. I mean, I was able to uh, bring in even Pulitzer Prize winning composers to work with the band. And I was counting today, and we commissioned and premiered over 30 pieces in those 25 years. And I started a recording project also. Started a recording project with the university bands that started in 1993. But I also organized an ensemble called the Keystone Wind Ensemble, which is somewhat of a semi-professional ensemble. But what was unique about it, and there's really no other ensemble, or there was, since I've retired, there was no other ensemble like it in the entire country, is that it was made up of faculty alumni and students from the institution. In other words, if you hadn't been a part of the institution in some way, you couldn't play in the group. So when we'd get together, and we were mainly a recording band, when we'd get together, you would have teachers sitting next to students, but students that they had maybe 20 years ago and now had earned doctorates in, let's say, trumpet performance, and they're sitting next to their teacher. And then I would fill in the band with current students, giving them the opportunity to perform with such a high caliber ensemble. Well, what was interesting about this band is they did it out of their love for music and their love for the institution. They never, I never gave, paid them anything. I gave them travel money and we were able to put them up in the school housing, dormitory housing during the summer. And we, we put out several discs on the Citadel label and then later on the uh, Clavier label. And towards the end of, well, I say towards the end, maybe the last 10 years of my time at IUP, we started a composer's voice series in where I would go interview a composer. And that interview would be on the CD along with recordings of their band music. The first person um, that we did was Norman Delajoyo. He was in his 80s, late 80s then. And in fact, he transcribed his... Um, New York profiles for the band to to record on the recording session in his late 80s. Another person, Alfred Reed, another Reed, H. Owen Reed, Ron Nelson, Fisher Tull, Robert Washburn. These all had, um, and even William Schumann, the former um, former director of the Juilliard School in Lincoln and Lincoln Center. I actually had taped an interview with him long before we had uh, recorded his music, but all of these came out 
on this clavier label with this keystone wind ensemble. So the idea of this exposure then through recordings and through commissioning music, because when another band would play the music, they would see that it came from, it was commissioned by the Indiana University Wind Ensemble. So anyway, I believe in those 25 years, I was able to kind of put the School of Music and the band program on the map through these various projects. Very much so. That is so impressive. And, you know, all those names, uh, people that I've, you know, heard of through the years and possibly heard some of their music because I'm always listening to different styles of music and different things. But anyway, what a great thing you did for the university. Well, I did it on my love for music and the love for my own alma mater. For, the, yeah. for, your, um, for your viewers, uh, Indiana, Pennsylvania is the name of the town. And so it's named, the school is named after the town. And it, for some reference, the great actor Jimmy Stewart was born in Indiana, PA. His dad had a hardware oh, store. Oh, my goodness. That's so <laughs> impressive. I'm glad you told me that, too. So it's in western Pennsylvania, just a, about 50 miles northeast of Pittsburgh. Wonderful. So not too far from New York. No, maybe a five-hour drive. Oh, oh, a little farther than I was seeing. Yeah, we're in western Pennsylvania. Okay. Well, thank you for that wonderful answer. Um, now we're going to shift to UW River Falls, which is just down the road here. And I want to know what you did there. And I, I heard about you doing conducting workshops. Right. Well, what was interesting is that I decided to retire after 25 years at IUP. And um, that was 36 years of teaching. And part of that reason was 25 was a good number. And also I had remarried. Yes. And my wife lived here in Hudson and we were, had lived apart for six years. Yes, so of course. So I come back, I figured I could afford it. So when I came back and got here, um, yeah. Chris Chernohoy, who had been a longtime friend because of both of us being college band directors, said, would you come? Would you be interested in teaching at UWRF? And I said, well, sure. What yeah. do you want me to teach? And she said, well, I've just become chair of the department. And there are some of my duties then that I can't teach because of my responsibilities right. as chair. So I started teaching conducting first at the school, which I love teaching conducting. It's probably my favorite course to teach. And I really enjoyed that. But then Dr. Roy, the composition teacher, retired. And I, I picked up composition as well. So for, I taught there for three years. I taught basically conducting and composition. And Chris and I um, hosted a workshop with the, with the very famous, my former teacher, Eugene Corporon from the University of North Texas, as our clinician. We hosted a workshop. And and I do get the opportunities to go and present workshops all over the country. I've done, I've done four virtual workshops this summer. In fact, I have one tomorrow morning at 8.30 for the um, South Dakota State University. I mean, sorry, North Dakota State University. So, oh. so I get involved with that. But for those three years, Chris was chair. And then yeah. the chairmanship or the chairpersonship rotates. So Chris was no longer chair after three years. And she came back. And said, she said, well, you can still do this. And I said, no, I think it's a good time for me now to retire for good. So I retired after three years of working UWRF. And Chris came back to her regular position where she could oh, assume. Oh, yes. Yes, I've had her on a couple times. And we've talked about the different, uh, her different facets there at the university when she was doing that. Um, well, she has running the department. She has boundless and endless energy. Oh. And she fact, has such great ideas. And in fact, I mean, she had a hand, unbeknownst to her, in my marriage. <laughs> and she has a she hand. She introduced you, I bet. Well, they were, my wife was taking a workshop there, and Chris had me come in as a oh, clinician. Yes. That's how I met her. And then she has a hand, which I'll share with you, in my association with the Grimethorpe Colliery Band. <gasps> that too? Yes. Oh, that's wonderful. And, she's like and the fairy godmother. She's like my she fairy is. godmother. She, she's amazing. I, I'm sure her ears are ringing right now. But, you know, she deserves, deserves so many accolades and how she's Absolutely. run that program there. And, of course, I know her from when she taught here 
And sure. it was, there was one time I, I actually had to be gone because of a funeral and directing a concert with my choirs. And she stepped right in and took over a day before. And she was amazing. And of course, her conducting skills are very impressive to me. Yes, she's very good. Yes. And I, I love people who can conduct rather than just kind of wave their arms and sort of you don't know where the beat is. There's a skill to it. There's certainly a skill set that you need to have. Well, for band, you need to show the beat, don't you? Well, you need to show more than that, too. Because yeah. you're, cause you're I ensemble. Think so. So Probably even that. more than vocal conducting, of which, well, you know. The, the thing about vocal conducting, you see, is that everyone in the ensemble sees everybody's part. That's true. And they're never more than four <gasps> people away yes. from somebody singing their part. Yes. We're in the band. You can be an entire, especially now with social distancing, you can be you know, 25 feet away from a person playing your part. So the idea well, of a focal point of the conductor is very important to that. Just reading a score is quite a feat, and I assume it's somewhat similar to an orchestra. That, well, yeah, actually. I mean, the only thing yeah. different, the only thing different is that there are more transpositions in a band than there oh, is in a band. wow. I think that is just fascinating you brought that out because I've never really conducted a band. But, you know, I've always felt like, well, I could step in and teach that class a little bit. But, you know, that would be difficult. You have to bring in all the solos and you have to do everything extra that, well, I hate to say it, but vocal people don't have to do quite as much. It's a little more, it's a little more, um, well, there, because there's so many different colors. You, know, yes. you have 25 different, basically, instruments in a oh, concert. Exactly. So even right. a double choir only has eight. <laughs> so You're right. it is a little bit different. You but are it's not definitely different than right. maybe conducting a, a large choral work than with orchestra. That's even harder than conducting oh, yeah. orchestra. Yeah, and it's like we did the Bach St. Matthew Passion my junior year at St. Olaf. And that was my favorite thing of my practically my whole college career. And I just admired my, you know, vocal director so much and how, how astute he was with all of that and how good he sure. was. And he would sit down and play it all on the organ where we had our, our um, choir lesson, our choir rehearsals. He'd play all the parts. And I'd be like, no, you can't do that. You don't have enough fingers, for one thing. But he was, he was just so impressive. Dr. Ken Jennings, I'm talking about my oh, yeah. teacher. I had to get back to him, just a little. But now, OK, I'm coming back. Um, today, we're going to talk about one of your more recent positions. When I read this, I was just astounded. I had no idea that you would be doing um, compositions and internationally and I found that very exciting so would you please talk about that Grimethorpe brass band in England actually sure. and what you did for that and you say you got the position through Chris well it's a it's Hi. a long story and I but it's an interesting story okay. I'll share it. my okay. my first connection to brass bands was actually in 1988 when I was teaching in North Carolina, and I actually became conductor of a brass band called the Triangle British Brass Band. And the Triangle is Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill in North Carolina. I was teaching in North Carolina. And I became the conductor of this band for three years, 1988 to 1990. And I actually took them to the national championship. It's called NABA, National Associations of Brass Bands of America. Um, and we won the national championship in 1989. So I was indoctrinated with brass band. In fact, when I got the job at, at Indiana University of Pennsylvania, I debated hard about leaving, not because of my current academic position then, but because of having to leave my brass band, which it was a wonderful family type atmosphere. I mean, there were several great musicians in there, but I also had I also had a think tank employee from IBM and I had a dentist playing in there and I had a lawyer playing in there. It was, it was the typical kind of community brass band. Hmm. So then I moved to Pennsylvania, totally removed from brass band for 25 years. Well, when I, when I retired and came here, 
one of my former teachers colleagues at Indiana, Gary Bird, who teaches at UWRF and lives in Spring Valley, said to me, hey, I play in a brass band north of the cities and we're taking an England tour. Would you like to play? Would you like to go along? I said, absolutely. Any, any excuse to travel. So I started playing in the Lake Wobegon brass band. Now, Lake Wobegon has been here in Hudson several times and played at the Phipps Center. And yes, I've heard them. So, so I started playing again because my idea was when I retired to go back to the thing that got me into music. And what got me into music was playing percussion as a, as a junior high and high school student. Oh. And so I wanted to start playing again when I retired. I, I, I didn't care about conducting. I mean, if I have a conducting opportunity, it's fine. But I wanted to pursue the playing again. So playing in the brass band was a real treat. Well, I started writing for the brass band as well because yes. I was there. And we would, certain occasions, we'd write and things like that. The, the tour I wrote a piece for. So anyway, fast forward a year or two. And while teaching at UWRF, Chris Chernohoy hears about this British composer, Nigel Clark, being on St. Um, St. Thomas campus. And that's right, St. Thomas, right? Yes. St. Paul, yeah. In St. Paul. Yeah, St. Thomas is going to be on St. Thomas Kansas campus working with the band there on this piece that he's written for solo cornet. And he's brought the solos along. Well, Chris, again, Chris, Chris nabs them and gets them to perform also at River Falls. Oh. Well, I've, I've heard of Nigel Clark. I've known the name for years. Mm -hmm. And he knew my name from all the wind band compositions I had done. But we'd never met. So we met at River Falls. And it was like brothers of different mothers. It's like we, we had <laughs> known each other for years. Mm -hmm. And we talked and talked, and he said, I, I want to provide some opportunities for you. So the first opportunity he provided me was actually with a community band in England, the Ainsford Concert Band. The Ainsford Band is a community band, but really, really fine players. I mean, a lot like the Encore Band or the Medalist Band in the, in the um, Twin Cities in Minneapolis. They're very, very good musicians. So mm -hmm. I decided to write him a piece. And in the, in the process of writing this piece, sent it to them, they said, well, would you come over and work with us? We'll pay your way. Well, as this lined up, it also lined up with the National Brass Band Championship in England, held at Royal Albert Hall. Oh. In so I go to, the, go to Ainsford, which is in Kent, southeast of London, Go to, go to Ainsford, work with the band for two days on the weekend, go up, go back to London, and attend rehearsals of the Grimethorpe Colliery Brass Band because Nigel Clark is associated with them. So I'm hearing them prepare for this national competition. Now, this national competition's been going on since the 1920s. In fact, in fact Arthur Sullivan of Gilbert and Sullivan was the person who organized it back then. And it was for, he kind of saved the brass band movement actually in the 20s. Well, the Grimethrow Colliery Band has been around since 1917. And these brass bands were formed to keep the miners. See, the colliery was a mine, a coal mine. Mm -hmm. They were, they were, they organized these brass bands to bring culture to these small towns and also to keep the miners out of trouble and not going in, into the pubs at night and drinking and getting into fights and things. And they gave them something to do after hours. And this brass band movement spread. I mean, I don't know if you've heard of the Black Dyke Mills brass band, one of the other famous, but Black Dyke Mills, it was a mill that created cotton and um, fabrics. So mm -hmm. these huge, huge industries set up these brass bands and then it became a very very um almost contagious musical activity somebody said that that from the beginning of brass bands which is actually the 1800s to the present they can notate about 200,000 brass bands have existed oh within the last 170 years in britain so anyway that's 
very fascinating to me that it would develop from that way. It sure did. And yeah. it's all amateur. And, I, and at this rehearsal, I said to them, how many of the people in this brass band are trained musicians? Went to college and got music degrees. They said, I think there's three or four. <laughs> so the rest of them, I said, well, how did you learn? He goes, I played in the youth band. And they have all of these bands had youth bands. And these kids, 10 years old, 12 years old, come up through the youth band and are taught by the players in the band. And I don't know if the, your viewers remember this movie. There was a very famous brass band movie in 1996 called Brass Off. Hmm. Basically about the mines closing, which is a true story. I mean, this, this story was fabricated some in the movie, but the true story is the mines were closed in 1992. And a lot of the funding of these bands suffered and many bands shut down because they didn't have funding. Well, this movie is about that. And though the, they're not talking about the Grimethorpe band in particular, they are basically outlining the Grimethorpe band. And in fact, the actual Grimethorpe brass band is the soundtrack for the movie. Oh, that's amazing. So, so they gained a lot of notoriety from that. So anyway, I'm going to these rehearsals. And the Friday night before the Saturday comp competition, we're in, we're in London. We had been in Grimethorpe for these rehearsals where the band kind of is local. It's in Yorkshire. We were in London now. Had a, there was a church that they rented to rehearse. And Nigel comes up to me. Nigel Clark, the composer, comes up to me. He goes, well, we had a board meeting today of the band. And the band would like to name you international composer and association to them. Oh. And I went, what? <sighs> yes. They, they want you to come aboard and write music for them. Wow. Well, I was flabbergasted. I almost cried. I mean, I was just That's overwhelmed. That's just beautiful. So this was announced at the rehearsal. And there's a photo that I hope is going to be shared with you that, that shows me shaking the conductor's hand with the band behind me. And that was at that Friday night rehearsal. Yes, I saw that photo where we've got it here. So we're going to try and put it up. Right. Mm -hmm. So now I'm, I'm so hyped up about brass band. I come home and I immediately write a piece for them. <laughs> about, a, about a six and a half minute overture. And I called it Hansel Overture. H-A-N-D-S-E-L. Hansel means a gift is a gift given to someone at the beginning of a venture or a gift of good luck. I thought that was a great name for this first piece I'd write for them. Yes. Well, this was all scheduled for a premiere on May 9th at Selby, Selby Abbey, which is this old abbey in Selby, England, which is in, oh. um, in the middle of Yorkshire. Gorgeous, gorgeous facility. I think there's a picture going to be shown of it. Yes, I well, saw it this, this morning. It's beautiful. Fantastic. Well, I was so excited. And I was so you're gonna... talking May 9th, 2020? Correct. This past oh, May. Oh, and of course, we know what Perfect. happened there. COVID hit, mm -hmm. and everything was shut down, including every one of their concerts, after, oh. like from mid yeah. So I don't know when this piece will be premiered. In fact, I was going to conduct half the concert as well. And I conducted oh. premiere that piece. And another piece of mine that I transcribed from an original band piece called San Luis Snapshots for, um, for solo horn and band. And I transcribed that for uh, solo horn and brass band. And right. the, their solo horn player was going to play it with us. Oh. So I encourage, the, I encourage your viewers to, to um, search Grime, the Grimethorpe Colliery Brass Band or Grimethorpe Brass Band and look at their website. There's a posting on it of a, of a piece by Nigel Clark, in fact, yes. um, that they've done virtually. It's, it's quite beautiful. So, so I have all this now, all this notoriety in England that I never had before. So I'm very excited about that. And, and I've written, during this pandemic, I've written a couple more brass band pieces that I hope that will eventually work their way into Grindthorpe's repertoire as well. I hope so. I really hope that can happen for you maybe next year. It would be really a, a great, great experience to be in that abbey. 
Well, oh, absolutely. Oh, my goodness. I can about imagine what the acoustics are like. Yeah, it would be incredible. <laughs> it'd be, it'd be an unbelievable. So now you have more time to compose. But I just love the, your enthusiasm is right there. I can, I'm, I'm really hoping you can do the performances and get back to England. That and I really great. owe it to Nigel Clark, who yes. is actually two years younger than me, but he's like my big, big musical brother, you know. And to I, Chris, Chris, yeah, because Chris, Chris. Ann has her yes. hand in it somehow. And if it weren't for Chris, I wouldn't have had any of this <laughs> come to bear. Exactly. Well, that's a great, great um, information there. And I, I know our viewers can look that up because I searched it today myself. And there was lots of choices for the music. Right. Well, now I'd like to get a little philosophical with you because okay. I think band music as well as vocal is an important part of the curriculum in the schools. And it's a lifetime love for many people. So I just wondered if you would share a little bit about your philosophy of music and how important it is, especially in these times. Well, yeah, in these times, very serious. You know, and there was a, a quote by uh, Wilhelm Furtwängler. Furtwängler was the conductor of the Berlin Philharmonic during the, um, during the Nazi siege. And he said, Never does a society need music more than when they think they can do without it. And I, I believe that, you know, we kind of live on that precipice of, of well, we really don't need you know, music is music is for the rich. Well, no, it isn't for the rich. And when you, when you go back to the basic, it's music education that's important. And that's right. to believe because music is used for so many venues that music is an, an extracurricular thing, but music is academic. And why I say that is, it is the only activity that students do in school that requires them to use both sides of their brain. Yes. The right side for feeling and emotion, the left side for the analytical. I mean, these students are, in their instruments, they're dividing up time, measured time. They're, they're creating durations of of lengths of sound. They're doing all these calculations along with physical dexterity that it requires. Yes. And they're putting feeling into the music to create this artistic presentation. There is nothing like that in any of their education. The other thing is that it provides things that no other activity in school provides self-worth, confidence, a sense of belonging, a sense of the world, uh, all these things that can't be measured on a standard test, but yeah. are so important to a person's character and ability to work and um, involve themselves in the world today. I always said, if all the leaders of the countries played a band instrument, there wouldn't be any wars. <laughs> Everybody would be playing in a, have that community feeling. See, it's the only thing that I know that you have an individual responsibility, yet the whole is the goal. And you say, well, that's sports. Yeah, but no one sits on the bench in band and choir. You don't have a first string, right? If mm -hmm. a student wants to play, they can play as long as they're willing to work. I could remember I didn't make the basketball team in ninth grade because I was too short and I had to play one-on-one -on -one with a guy that was about five inches taller than me. And if he won, he got on the team. If I won, I got on the team. Now this is 1968. <laughs> How long ago is that? Is that 52 years? It's, um, it's not quite as long ago as I remember. <laughs> I remember that to this day because I wasn't asked. See, yeah, well, that's will you come the way it practices? was. Will you come to all the practices? Will you work hard? Because yeah. I would. But see, yeah. that's, that's what they ask of you. They don't care if you're tall. They don't care if you're short. They don't care if you're big, you're little. 
They don't care of your race, your gender, your sexual preference. They don't care. If you're willing to work, then you have a place in a, in a musical ensemble. It's probably the most politically correct activity in a school, and it's been that way for decades. So the idea of enriching, we don't need any more, I mean, I say we don't need any more scientists. I'd like to, there to be a scientist who discovers a vaccine. <laughs> but I guess what I'm saying, we need people that have souls and have yeah. built their hearts yes. and have a caring, caring approach to humanity and their approach to living. And, I, and music and the arts, and particularly music, provides that for individuals. And it provides that type of wholeness to their being that they don't get in any part of their education. So that's why music's important. Oh, fact, my word. It's a necessity. You have given me an answer that really touches me because I'm totally on your philosophy and I agree with you. I, I do think, I wish everybody could do music in the school. I mean, like I taught a lot of elementary music and they loved it, but, but we also learned. And it was, you know, it's a little more select now when you get to the high school, but you're not so much so for the band. You well, really can be in the band. There's a place for them. There's a place. A lot of students don't want to put in the time because there is a lot of personal time, you know, and the yes. problem is I, I call it the eye brain society in that if I can't push a button and make my instrument play, I don't want to play it, you know, that they actually, yeah. it's, you know, it's old school. It's hands on. You have You're to practice. Right. Perfect. Oh, great answer, Jack. That, that just made my day. Well, I've got, I've got a quick bonus question. We are Thank getting you. to the end of the interview, but I just have to hear your ideas on what are your three favorite selections of music for bands? That's tough because, I mean, I have yeah. put out a list of what I think are the top 20 best pieces and things. Oh, I yeah. My, my favorite piece for bands. And I'm not, I'm not saying it's the greatest piece ever written for band. It's one of the best. But it's my favorite piece for band. It is Symphony No. 6, or Symphony for Band by Vincent Persichetti. Mr. Persichetti wrote this in 1955. I was one year old when he wrote it. And um, oh, I might have been 56. Sorry, 56, I was two years old. And mm -hmm. um, he called it his Symphony No. 6, then Symphony for Band, because he he felt that the band was as worthy of classification in his listings of symphonies as were orchestras. So instead of removing it from his list of symphonies and then just numbering the orchestral symphonies, he actually gave it a number in his opus. And, um, but it's, it's a phenomenal piece. And um, it would be one of the pieces that I would, there's a movement in that, the second movement I would have played at my funeral. Oh, the wonderful. Second, the second piece is, is a very famous piece by Percy Granger called Lincolnshire Posey. And it's, Granger went out into the hinterlands of England with a wax cylinder recorder and recorded folk singers singing old folk songs. And he came up with a sixth, six movement piece based on folk songs. So he called these little posies, little flowers oh, from Link, the yes. area of Lincoln. That's neat. And then maybe the third piece that's my favorite, and it's because it's very personal to me. It's a symphony for band by composer Robert Washburn. Now, Dr. Washburn taught at um, State University of New York at Potsdam for years, but he was my composition teacher. Oh, and wow. He took me as a student. I remember him asking me if I could show him some of my music, and all I had were theory assignments at that point. I was a sophomore in college, and he agreed to take me as a student, a composition student, in the summer of 1973. And, sorry, 74. 1974. So I went up to New York and studied with him in the summer. Um, I remember there was a lady, Genevieve Bowman, who was the, who was the director of, of students. She was so impressed that somebody from 
from Maryland who was going to school in Pennsylvania, wanted to come study with Washburn. She gave me in-state tuition. She just matriculated me, basically, so I wouldn't have to pay out-of-state fees and tuition. I'll never forget that. And I spent the summer of 74 and the summer of 75 studying with him. But the first piece of his I ever heard was the Symphony for Band, and I dearly love that piece. I think it's a, a neglected piece. And um, the beauty is with this Keystone Ensemble, he is one of the composers that we featured. Oh. I interviewed him and his symphony is on that recording that we did of his music. So I was able to pay back my teacher with a recording. So that, those are my three. Persichetti well, Symphony, Lincolnshire yeah. Post, and Washburn Symphony for Band. Well, I have to... I have to expand my listening a little bit. But I, I did want to know that because I know you, you had so much experience in, in directing, composing, and all of it, and I knew that you would have favorites. And I know we could go on, but I'm, I'm running out of time, and I, I just want to thank you so much for doing the interview today. Um, it's just been wonderful talking to you. Well, it's been my pleasure. And I appreciate your constant commitments to the arts. Well, thank you, know, you. I think it's so important. And especially at this time when, when the arts are, are kind of dormant right now because we can't yes. have audience and live performances. But we'll be back. And we have to keep the, keep the yes. faith that eventually we'll be back full, full strength. Right. It's really hard to give up my singing, but I can warble around the house a little, so that works. Well, thank you again, and I hope um, I hope our audience enjoyed the show and, and and learned some things about band music and and Jack's philosophy, which is just amazing. So, thank you for watching today. I hope you enjoy the show. <laughs>